Hey there, fourth trimester listeners. Our program today is proudly sponsored by Family Album, your secure haven for sharing baby photos and videos. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love, one photo at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah Trott, and welcome to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm a new mama, and this podcast is all about postpartum care for the first few months following birth, the time period also known as the Fourth Trimester. My postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, is my co-host. She's a mother, grandmother, perinatal educator, birth and postpartum care provider. Fourth Trimester Care, our topic, is about the practical, emotional, and social support parents and baby require. And importantly, it helps set the tone for the continuing journey of parenting. This is Esther Gallagher hosting today's fourth trimester podcast. Sarah isn't joining us today, sadly, but we have a wonderful, wonderful guest, Monique the doula, <laughs> the doula <laughs> Monique, Monique Callan, and she's went She's going to tell us all about her practice as a birth and postpartum doula, which of course is very exciting to me because that's what my career has been as a birth and postpartum doula. But before we get started, I just want to remind our listeners that we have various ways uh, that you can be in touch with us. We have a Facebook page and we have um, a newsletter that you can sign up for. And we also have ways that you can help sponsor us if you're in able and inclined to even just a dollar a podcast would just really really help us out we don't we don't really have any personal income from this podcast um, it's all personal outgo <laughs> but we love doing it and here we are okay so I'm so excited to have Monique on the podcast I uh, encountered her on Facebook quite a while ago, and we've just <laughs> had our lives <laughs> and, and not a great chance to um, connect via the podcast. So here we go. So Monique, I am going to hand the microphone over to you, metaphorically speaking, and just tell us all about yourself. Thank you, Esther. Hi, everyone. I'm Monique Cowan, aka Monique Kadula. Um, I am a birth and postpartum doula, and I have been doing this work for the last six and a half years. Um, I am a mother of one very bright, very funny seven-year-old girl, and she is actually the reason why I began doing this work. Um, before I became a doula, I had never even heard of uh, the word doula. I'd never heard of it at all. Um, I was not educated in birth really at all, um, let alone home birthing or natural birthing or any of the things that we deal in. And um, I was actually quite afraid to give birth at all. Um, I was, uh, I had resolved in my mind that I would not have children. Because why would I want to, um, why would I want to do that? It seemed painful and scary. And, um, so when I found out that I was pregnant, I was terrified. And so my only thought was, I just don't want to feel any pain. <laughs> and so I did massive amounts of research just looking for what is the least painful way to give birth without having surgery because I was also terrified of having a cesarean. And um, I had stumbled across the um, profession of a doula. And Yay. then, right, <laughs> I, just, I happened to stumble across it. And I believe the first thing that I heard about was um, hypnobirthing. And, um, so, but at that time, I just, I was working for a nonprofit and was 
making basically donations. That was, that was my salary. It was a donation. And so there was no way that I could afford a hypnobirthing doula. So, um, a, a friend that I went to high school with, I noticed on her friend list on Facebook that one of her friends was a doula and she lived in, um, Los Angeles. And, um, I was in Atlanta at the time moving back to Los Angeles. And so I contacted her and this woman, her name is Dara Baskin. And, um, she is, I mean, easily the most calm, loving, easygoing, sweet natured, and yet strong person that I have ever come across. Just what you need. <laughs> exactly what I needed exactly what I needed <laughs> and when I connected with her um she became a friend a confidant a all-around shoulder to lean on there was lots of drama and everything which I'll talk about a little bit later too um going on during my pregnancy and she was just very sweet and understanding and non-judgmental and help me get through all of that at the same time teaching me how to get my mind together and completely shift my thinking surrounding birth. And I ended up having a very empowering uh, non-medicated vaginal birth in a hospital. And um, my, it was, very much um just it was just the most awesome experience and I just remember as soon as everything settled down I just said this is what I want to do <laughs> yeah. and I know a lot of women come into this profession that way um so and then as I was um learning how to be a mommy I realized how very hard <laughs> and exhausting and just sometimes just, I mean, almost cruel, cruelly exhausting sometimes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and that's when I learned about um, postpartum doulas. I was not able to have one. Um, but thankfully I have, I do have a lot of family who surrounded and supported me. Um, but that was, that was when I said, you know, this is something that women are desperately in need of. And yet it is a profession that is, um, very underrated. And, um, I don't think, I mean, the word, the, the, profession of doula and midwifery is starting to again gain a lot of traction in our society um, but be postpartum doulas um, are still kind of under the radar so to speak so um, we're gaining traction as well but this is something that I'm very very passionate about because the the fourth trimester is <laughs> is is where it is where we are made or broken yeah. And, uh, you know, there are so many women and men who are, um, suffering from postpartum mood disorders and, um, because they don't have the support that they need. And so I am passionate about seeing families healthy and whole and, um, providing that support for them. So that's why I do what I do. That is awesome. I, I, I resonate with every word of your story. I, I, I will say, um, I wasn't afraid of, of being pregnant or giving birth. That, that part came very easily to me. I was very lucky in that one particular way, but, yeah. you know, beyond just, um, the logistics of, of, finding a midwife, like from, from there on, I, I totally resonate with every word you say. And, and people who know me know that the thing that really radicalized me was after having the baby <laughs> and, yeah. and be, and being alone 
in that. And um, yeah. uh, even even the helpers would who would help had, you know, grave limitations. I just yeah. I, I yeah. think and I and I was in a fairly normal situation as far as my physiology and still needed care yeah. that I never received. So I, I'm thrilled to hear your story. I, I resonate with the difficulties of it. Um, but I think that you're pointing exactly to the things that we don't know in our culture about mm-hmm. and that we need to understand and that here we are, we're in a profession to do exactly that support. And um, tell me, uh, a little bit about how you learned to be a postpartum doula. Since you, as you say, you didn't experience firsthand having a trained postpartum doula. Um, tell me a little bit about how you evolved your practice, because I, like you, I didn't have a postpartum doula. Um, but I, you know, heard that there was such a thing. And I thought, well, yeah, that needs right. to happen. <laughs> Oh, right. <laughs> hey, um, I actually, what's funny is that, um, I'm, uh, you know, as I evolve in my practice and as I learn more and um, add skill set, um, it's the 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 synchronicity uh, and serendipities and and just the the coincidences, if you can call it that, that mm. I've been finding is that, you know, every woman that I've met that is in this profession has said, you know, it really is almost like a calling. Yeah. And that, you know, some of the work that, that we do, we've always done. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, as it's from, I don't know, from the time I was old enough to work, I've worked with children and babies and women, and I've taken care of my child, my my friends' children, and you know, accompanied them to the hospital when they've had babies, and helped them to take care of their babies, and you know, learned about remedies and you know, for diaper rash and all 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 <laughs> kinds of things. Yeah, so all like, those I, little things. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like so it's. I've I've always done it, and so when I I I trained through Birth Arts Inter- International, and um, as I went through the curriculum, it really was like, oh, I do this, oh, I do this, oh, okay, That's... like I I do this, and it really was. It became um a lot of the things that I learned about what women need was just this is this is something that I need. This is something that I needed. And yes. like you were saying, like things that I didn't get, you know, not because of, not because people, you know, weren't willing, but simply that they had their limitation and that, you know, they didn't know, <laughs> you know, you don't know if it, the thing is that you don't know what you don't know. Right. I mean, how would your family who, who I'm going to guess never heard of a sitz bath, a postpartum sitz bath, no, to scrub out your tub and make the herbs and right. put put you in the tub with them. Right. I mean, you know, of course they don't know that. My mom wouldn't know that. And she's a very loving, caring person. Right. You know, but I mean, the nobody did that, it for her. <laughs> fortunately, you know, from, you know, their traditions, you know, coming from, you know, I'm an African-American woman. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of tradition that is passed down that we don't know why we do, you know, it's just that the old folks said to do it. And so you did it. And so, you know, like my, I have a, my grandmother who's from uh, a tiny town in Texas and, you know, would tell me, okay, you make sure you keep yourself warm. You don't go outside for the first month. You know, you keep that, you keep that baby with you. You know, everybody shouldn't be kissing on the baby. You know, mm-hmm. things like that, that we teach our, to our clients for the, their health and their well-being that, you know, is tradition for, you know, a lot of cultures and, you know, to tell you what to do. So some, some of the things, you know, I got some things are old wives tales that, you know, I actually go through with some of the families of my clients, you know, that, you know, some stuff 
you can take <laughs> and some you can leave. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so I was, I was fortunate in that regard, but as I was going through the curriculum, you know, I did see that, like, there are lots of things that, you know, as women, um, in families like that, we just, that we just do, that I was just doing for friends, for, you know, other family members that we just learned how to do. And, um, you know, and then just learning, like, this is such, I mean, I know people love to say, like, prostitution is the oldest profession, but (laughs) you can't have the prostitutes unless people are born. So (laughs) Exactly. Oh, my God, I love you. I have said exactly the same thing myself. Yes. The oldest profession has to first be a midwife and then the doula. So, yes, you know, so... (laughs) Then we maybe we'll to, get her get around to prostitution. Right. <laughs> All right. So the But only if we have to. Come here. They gotta they gotta get born here first. So <laughs> Yeah. So I think it's just something that's innate. And then I actually just learned that my maternal great grandmother was either she she passed away so young and when my grandmother was only fifteen, but my grandmother just recently told me that she was actually like either the town midwife or she did something like do the work. Yeah. She would go to the homes of the women who were having babies. And she said, I just remember as a little girl that she would, you know, she would take me and I would sit in the living room and she would go in the room and, and, you know, we wouldn't leave until the baby was here. That's so cool. (laughs) Right. Right. And that's it. So it's in me. It's in my blood. It's sure is. What I'm supposed to be doing. So fantastic. Well, hopefully you'll find a way to find out a little more about her. You yeah. know, in, in terms yeah. of all this, maybe there's some kind of record somewhere. That is so great, Monique. I love I love hearing about those kinds of things. Well, so um, why don't you? If you don't mind, take mm-hmm. us through kind of what it, what a day or day to day is like in say the first week of care that you give your clients postpartum. Like, you know, what are the typical things that you might encounter with them and and address? Okay, so typically, um, if if the client has had um, let's just say a, a, a vaginal birth, um, unmedicated. Typically, what I'm doing is I'm helping her with comfort for whatever discomfort or pain she might be experiencing um, after birth. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, that also includes, if the client um, wishes, that also includes um, some herbal remedies. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, which includes teas or, um, I also make a, uh, herbal six bath for them. And for those who don't know, I'm sure your listeners already know what a six bath is, but like you said, you, you scrub the tub out, you run water as hot as mama can stand it about just a couple of inches of water. Um, I steep the herbs in a big pot of boiling water, pour that in. And, uh, she sits in it for, uh, at least 15, 20 minutes. And that exactly. helps, and that will help her to heal. It will help to, uh, keep away infection. It will, uh, help her help the pain and whatever discomfort she is having. And it also just helps her to feel better. Just, you know, sometimes some things we do. And that's another thing that I, that I do. I make sure that, um, she's able to feel like a person. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, not yeah, an easy thing when you're going through such a profound right. transformation, yes. right? Yeah. So, and the first week I also help if she is, uh, wanting to breastfeed, I assist with, um, breastfeeding because again she's a new mama and the baby is a new person and so everything is a learning curve 
And um, a lot of, I do a lot of reassuring that she's doing a good job and that everything is okay. Um, mm-hmm. I don't, I think, you know, it's, it's, our society's weird. It's, <laughs> you know, we, ha- we have this thing where, you know, we deify mothers and we also demonize them. <laughs> All in the same, you know, it's it's, uh, it's a weird, weird, weird thing. Yeah. So, you know, in ancient times, you know, it's not that women did not go through the same struggles, you know, as new mothers. Like, people still had issues with, you know, is am I producing enough breast milk? They still had issues with, you know, I'm tired and all baby wants to do is sit around and eat. They still had issues with all of these things. The difference is, is that there were women surrounding them to show them what to do. Mm, yeah. And, so, and they would have seen any number of these issues yes, gr- growing up. Yes, just, it just would have been around. Which is, so. which is just the, the whole thing. It's just the whole, when we normalize what happens, it's like we, when we watch, it, the only thing that we know about birth and postpartum is what we see on television (laughs) you're either seeing somebody who is just you know completely exhausted zombified and you know spit up everywhere with torn clothes (laughs) and the house is just crazy or you're seeing somebody who is like floating on some sort of lotus petals <laughs> and you know, hair flowing in the breeze with, you know, the 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 light just out of nowhere just gleaming on it. So it's you know it's almost like it's, almost virginal, wouldn't you say? Yes. Like it's almost like you're a yes. virgin. Like, you know, you, you haven't have ever like, had sex, right, let alone like, been pregnant and pushed a baby out. Right, you're right, just, let alone yeah. an entire human being just came yeah. from your vagina. Like that yes. you're at least a little sleepy, like at least. <laughs> And so, like, so part of part of what I do for my clients is just that, because a lot of us, even if we have children in our family, a lot of us just we just have no clue what the fourth trimester looks like. And so a lot of my mothers in the beginning feel very inadequate and feel very much like whatever they do. It's like, well, you know, am I doing it right? Am I doing it? I don't know if I'm doing this right. Am I doing this right? It's like, no, you're good. You're okay. You know, so that's what most of what I do is that. And along with making sure that, you know, their surroundings are, you know, suitable for them. So I'll do dishes. I'll pick up clothes. I might vacuum the floor. I'll do baby's laundry. I'll do her laundry you know, things like that and just and making sure that she is getting less. So, you know, sometimes that means you want me to hold the baby while you take a nap and I'll do that. And, you know, so it's it's funny when you when you say like, hey, what is a typical day? It's like I can go through a day explaining it to people and they're kind of like, oh, so you're like a nanny. <laughs> No. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and, and I understand how people could believe that, but it's that it's that line of thinking that kind of keeps women from asking for help. Right. Because when you, when you think of nanny, you think of this is a luxury. This is a person that rich people hire. To, to hand their of, baby over to. Right. To take right. care of my kids when I don't feel like it or when mm-hmm. I don't want to. Yeah. You know, and, and might I add, having a nanny is, it can be important too. Because sure, sometimes yeah. you don't feel like it. <laughs> so, yeah. Like I have a seven year old. Sometimes I don't feel like it. Yeah. I just, can we keep it real? Sometimes, Thank goodness for play dates, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. And so sometimes, yes, we do. Well, sometimes we call our parents or our friends. Or, Can you please take this child? Because I'm going to, but that is a, it's a real thing, you know, and 
And, and it's real with newborns. Moms will yes. feel like, you know what? I've given every molecule I can give exactly. and I'm exhausted beyond my capacity yes. and I need yes. 30 minutes to close my eyes yes. in order to get back at it, you know? So yeah. And beautiful. it helps for someone because it's, it's not just good for mom, it's good for the baby. Because we know we have all the studies about, you know, allowing newborns to cry it out and purple crying and all this stuff. But these are things that happen when you have exhausted parents with no support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if they just, if if mom can get some sleep and baby has a fresh pair of boobs to lay on. (laughs) That's what bosoms are for. Yes, Yes. that's right. A fresh pair of arms to hold them in that awkward position that they've become so <laughs> fond of, looking out the window. I mean, you know, you know how it is. Like, baby, like, do. you know, he, like, he doesn't want to lay this way. He wants to lay this way with my wrist all turned. Okay. So if there's a fresh pair of arms who can do that, it's invaluable because now you have a mother who is rested. And who can, who can have, while you're resting, and this is, it's so important. It's like, it's not about mom. It's not just about being tired. A mother needs that rest in order to recover from childbirth, in order to recover from pregnancy, in order for her hormones to go back into the alignment where they need to be. Mm-hmm. In order for them to, and and that's with anybody. If you go in to a doctor's office and you have to have surgery, or you've gone through some sort of trauma, or you've had some major illness, the first thing the doctor is going to tell you before he sends you home is you need to rest. Yeah, <laughs> it's the first thing they tell you before they write you a prescription of anything. Any great doctor is going to say you need to rest. I know you feel okay. (laughs) I know you feel fine, but you need to rest because rest is the only way that the body can rejuvenate itself. It's the only way the mind rejuvenates itself. And so having someone like me, that's something that I also have to, I I have some clients (laughs) where this is like the biggest, this is the biggest hurdle for them to, to, to climb. Mm-hmm. Because for some reason they believe that if they're not doing something, they're lazy. Yeah. So they have to be doing something. It's like, no. At this time, during this four to six weeks. Your job. <laughs> your, your, your whole job is to have a seat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Monique, um, I wanted to back up on on a couple of things. And since mm-hmm. we're on the subject of rest, do you get the opportunity to kind of help your clients be well nourished? Because I find, I, or, or at least it's my belief, I'll say that clients will rest better if they're not hungry. You know, if, if yes. they've, if they yes. haven't been eating while they're breastfeeding, then the first thing yes. they're going to need is to eat. And so I try to get clients to do eat when their baby eats Mm because you can, and that way they'll be ready to sleep when their baby sleep. But that means that in my practice, like I often have to make sure that that food's in front of them, you know, prepared and in front of them. And so do you give much attention to that in your practice? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I cook for my Mm. clients. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes they don't want that, but I, but I go into their refrigerator. Like yeah. <laughs> usually the first thing that I do when I come into that, into the home after our initial meeting and everything, the first thing that I do is I'm looking to see if she has water and food in front of her. Mm-hmm. And if she does not, that's the first thing that I do is go into the refrigerator, get something, snacks, nuts, berries lunch meat, whatever mm-hmm. is in there that is good for um, nourishing mama. I get it and I get a huge jug of water <laughs> and here mm-hmm. you go. You need to eat. You need to drink. 
Yeah. When's the last time you ate? That's the that's the first question. When's the last time you ate? When you had? What did you have? That is how great. Are you, how are you feeling? <laughs> are you ha- are you having headaches? Are you feeling weak? What did you What did you eat? Um, yeah. I'm also very much um, my personally. I'm very much old school, so I'm very much a stickler for warming food. Mm-hmm. Um, during yes. that initial postpartum period, um, every client doesn't follow that, and that's fine. I give them whatever they will take. Yeah, simply because you just need to eat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, you gotta know, get something you know, in I'm, there. Yes, and so just like you know, we we have all these fights about how what's best for baby, and you know, we have the thing <laughs> fed is best. Fed is best for mama. So we don't, you know, you want me to go to the hamburger stand? That's all you'll eat? Okay, cool. I'll go around the corner and I'll go get you a burger if that's all you'll eat. But you need to eat. Yeah. Eat the lettuce and tomato with it. <laughs> yes. Right. Oh, please. Exactly. 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 Well, and- but usually, usually with clients, especially if if I cook, I'll come in and I'll tell them, look, I know this recipe you're going to love it. It's so good. Mm-hmm. And, you know, unless they have just an aversion to certain things, usually just a nice, hot, warming, hearty soup. Yeah. They all love. Yeah. And don't you find, too, that so often, you know, assuming they've been in the hospital for however long, you know, two, two three days, that they don't know yet how hungry they are but the moment you put some good nourishing stuff in front of them it disappears and they open their eyes wide and go oh my god I didn't even know how hungry I was you know every time or or they'll look at the portions I bring in which are ginormous and they'll go oh I'll never be able to eat that and then it's gone and they're like (laughs) Wow. Okay. And I try to point that out if there's a partner or a grandma around, like, did you see what just happened? Mm-hmm. That needs to happen like eight times a day. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah. Yes. It also happens when they are thirsty. Oh, yeah. And they don't realize how dehydrated they are. Yeah. And then yeah. I bring them a huge jug of water. I have to drink all of this. This is it. Except if you feel the need to sit, it'll be right here. And then it's an, an hour later, it's, can I have some more water? I know. Yeah. I know. Because yeah. you you have all of this to replenish. All of this came out of you. Yeah, it basically goes in your <laughs> mouth and out your boobs. Pretty and, much. Anyway, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to just make note of for, for the sake of our listeners is that generally speaking, when we're going to provide you a sits bath, prepare, prepare and help you have a sits bath, we want to know that a good 90% of your any swelling you might have incurred giving birth has resolved. So we're not going right. to put you in a hot bathtub right. if you're vulva is still pretty swollen and perineum is pretty swollen Mm -hmm. but um but the herbs are typically herbs that will will help resolve that last bit of swelling and the soothingness of the warm water and the rest that you get while you're in the tub is is efficacious so yeah i just i remember when you were talking about it i thought well if they think this is going to happen on day one no <laughs> what, what, we what might I need to make, what i do make for um for clients who do have a lot of swelling is um the pad sickle yeah tell us about that well the pad sickles are basically you take um the postpartum pad and you can put um, aloe gel um, not uh, alcohol free witch hazel which is an astringent mm-hmm. um, and you can put uh, make a tea of any herb that you like or not but um, some of the herbs that I use would be maybe lavender um calendula, 
maybe mm-hmm. come free plantain leaves, especially if there's any um, tearing that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just keep those. You can mix it all together and then you pour it on the pad. Make sure it's um, on top of some sort of plastic or something. And you can wrap those um, in foil, fold them up, put them in the freezer. And once you're ready to, um, when you go to the restroom to change your pad, you put one of those on and it feels so good. Yeah. <laughs> it's so yeah. soothing. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so um, those are really easy to make. Um, you can, like I said, you can use herbs or not. I know everyone doesn't use them. And before I use any herbs with anyone, I make sure that there are no allergies. Um, and that um, their doctors say it's okay. So, um, yeah. But, yeah, pad circles are great for um, right from the hospital, from for day one yeah. through about, through the, like the first week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. They're great. That's even the kind of thing that I could imagine a birth doula who's going to visit her clients the next day in the hospital yes, could, the could, could bring in the, um, in the cooler that she brought the placenta home in <laughs> right? <laughs> with the, <laughs> with the placenta pills, if she's managed to do those right. or not, you know, but, but give mom, you know, some, some padsicles to use while she's still in the hospital. I mean, they'll give you an ice pack. That's, better than a stick in the eye, but, um, right. yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Wow. Yeah. And, <laughs> you um, take great care of your clients. And usually before we do, before we do, um, the cyst bath or if, like the client can't do a cyst bath because maybe they don't have a bathtub. Mm. Um, if the hospital gives you a peri bottle putting that, um, the cyst tea, whatever, um, herbs you see putting that in a peri bottle and using that as like a watch is very soothing as well yeah and healing yes now um you have a seven-year-old I, I have do. I happen to have an eight-year-old grandson it's pretty fun stuff um yeah. uh what does she think about having a mom who's a doula <laughs> she she wants me home all the time, but you know, yeah. Um, she is. It's funny because my family is, and I and I think this about most families. You know, in 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 our society, we're not very open about um, sexuality and talking about it and mm-hmm. using the correct terms for things. But <laughs> you know, when she was two or three really earlier than that. I mean, I, I was training um, to become a doula when she was born. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I had the childbirth books all over the place all the time. And so when she could thumb through them, when she was old enough to just kind of look through them like a picture book, she did. And so <laughs> <laughs> she, she knows exactly what it looks like for a woman to have a baby and she knows where babies come from. Not, you know, how they get in mama's womb, but that they come from mama's womb. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, That's the important part. <laughs> yeah. So she's, she's all for it. She used to breastfeed her dolls and her toys. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> so, you know, she's, she's, um, she, she's cool with it. She's yeah. very nonchalant about it. She, you know, she's at the age now where it's like, are we talking about babies again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, she, but tells, you know, she tells all her friends though. She said, "My mom's a doula. You know what a doula is? My mom's a doula." <laughs> right, right on. Yeah, and that now she's, is great. She's actually her school. We she she was homeschooled, and so now um, she's in a she, we're part of a homeschooling co-op, which is more, you know classroom time for kids who are homeschooled yeah. and um, a lot of those uh, kids have parents who are doers so isn't that great swap and like, yeah it's, it's yeah. awesome <laughs> yeah wish wish there was more of that when my kids were young 
Yeah. You know, that kind of cooperation. But it is great the way our kids just know stuff. You know, they know this whole uh, realm of just really, honestly, everyday life Mm -hmm. with a certain kind of, um, you know, um, ownership and agency that, frankly, a lot of their peers don't even can't even relate to I mean they're the go-to kids because they know stuff and um yeah I mean I remember my my son when he was really little breastfeeding a doll (laughs) (laughs) that's the kind of guy he is (laughs) yeah um uh but yeah hey fellow parents can we take a moment to reflect on the joyous chaos that is parenthood You know those days when our hearts swell with love at the sight of our little ones and we're bursting at the seams to share every adorable moment with the world. But let's be real. Some things are better kept in the family, and your loved ones who matter the most aren't always close by, and they might not be that tech-savvy either. So how can you easily share your baby's beautiful growth with loved ones while keeping your precious memories secure? I remember the frustration of trying to use some of the big tech photo solutions, only to find they fell short of what I needed. That's when I stumbled upon something truly remarkable, the family album map. The Family Album Map was created to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's an orderly and totally secure haven for your family's personal memories. I love that there's no third-party ads, no unwanted eyes, unlimited storage, and that it's totally free. So to all the parents who are out there still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. It's yes. good stuff. Yeah. She, she stalked my family on a few. I remember she was, she might have been three years old. And <laughs> we right on at, schedule. Yes. We were at a family function. I think it, it might have been Thanksgiving or something like that, but basically everyone was in the, in the room. And she comes to me, she says, Mommy, my vagina itches. <laughs> and ev- I mean, just. You could hear <laughs> a pin drop. <laughs> uh, uh, you could hear a mouse dropping a pin. You could hear just, and that, I mean, just the gas that happened in the room. And they were like, "Did she just say vagina?" And I was like, "That's what it's called." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, that's what she said. That's great. <laughs> I love it. Well, so um. Monique, tell me a little bit about the community you work in. Like, who who are your clients, and um, you know what kind of what's your range? You know, and here in the Bay Area, um, you know, one of the things doulas ask each other is like, so what's your range? You know, do you go yeah. as, do you go up to past Marin, and do you go down the peninsula? You know, people want to know kind of what's what the scope is on various levels so why don't you talk a little bit about who your clients are and where and when i am in southern california and i serve the greater la long beach um through north orange county area um a lot of my work as of late um has been with um in inner city with uh, a lot of women of color as I'm not sure um, if a lot of your listeners are aware of um, the statistics of black women and black babies that uh, black babies are two times two to three times more likely to die before their first birthday than any other babies in America and black women are four times more likely to die from childbirth in uh, childbirth related complications, uh, than any other woman in America. Yeah. So, so if you don't think we me, have institutional racism in America, you, it's time to wake up. And we've posted on our Facebook page, various, um, you know, Facebook articles and things of that nature. So at least I hope our Facebook listeners <laughs> right. are, are, getting a clue we need so to, we need yeah. to be aware and so as of late what i have been doing with uh, myself and some other duos that i've met um is making sure that these things stop mm. no woman in this country 
should be dying because of childbirth. This right. is 2018. Yeah. It is ridiculous. Yeah. And the fact that we are the only, the only industrialized nation where uh, maternal mortality rates are actually going up. Is it's insane. Just, yeah. it is unthinkable. Yeah. The fact that you have nations that are considered third world nations like Jamaica, like some, you know, some nations in, in Asia, smaller countries in Asia that have maternal mortality rates that are actually going down mm-hmm. and ours is going up and we have a person in office who would think to really say terrible and horrible things about some of these nations where, I mean, Ugh. at least their mothers aren't dying from childbirth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know. Yeah. So, um, so now I serve everyone. I do. I serve, I serve all clients. And actually, the paying clients help me to help clients who are unable to pay. That's so, great. And do you ha- do you have an explicit understanding with your clients in terms of that? I'm curious. Um, I do. I um, there have been. I don't. You know, it's funny because on my website, I don't necessarily say like, "Hey, I have a sliding scale." Or I sometimes mm-hmm. do pro bono work. It, but um, I do believe that you know. I come across, and that's even with paying clients, I come across people who need me, you know, and Mm -hmm. who will ask me. And so I do, I do barter with people for services. I've done that before. I actually, the last client that I had, um, she's a hairstylist. So we bartered um, a few hair salon visits Mm -hmm. with, you know, my Google services. So, right. (laughs) Hey, getting um, your hair done is not cheap. Yeah. No, it is not, Esther. No, it is not. So, you know, and you know, it help it help it helps me in my business as well because you have to look the part if you want to go before people. You have to look a certain way. So, yeah. Um, but yes, I do have. I do go to clients and let them know that. Um, I don't actually say to clients, "I will do this for you for free." Mm-hmm. Only because I do believe in allowing people their dignity. Yeah. And that um, energy has to be exchanged. And so it doesn't always have to be mon- monetary. Right. So yeah. if I tell someone this is what I do and they want my services and they're excited about my services, usually they'll say, you know, the, you know, of course they ask how much. And they'll kind of say, well, you know, and I'll say, but I can work with you. Mm-hmm. Whatever yeah. you, you know, we can, we can work together. You know, don't just, don't walk away because you feel like you can't pay me. Right. So, because yeah. it's, it's very important that, you know, everyone needs this support. I, I just, everybody needs this support. And yeah. so I do not turn people down simply because they can't pay me. So that's what, yeah. um, that's what I, that's what I do. That's who I serve. I'm, I, I want to serve the community. I am learning a lot more now to adding more herbal services to my skill set. And, um, because we just, our, uh, the community just needs people who can um, help them without people who can hear them, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, you know, women and babies are dying because there are people who are refusing to listen. Bottom line. Absolutely. You know, there are people who are refusing to, you know, refusing to listen and refusing to hear the pain that people are in and refusing to, you know, to act believing whatever it is that they believe, I don't, I don't even know, you know, but, you know, there has to be people in the community that the folks out there can come to and people who can advocate for them Yes, and yeah. say, Hey, you know what? <laughs> I, I, she says her stomach was hurting. This is not normal for after birth. This is not normal. You need to take a look at what's going on. 
Yes. But sometimes that's all people need is somebody just to have their back. You know, and so, I think so. I mean, it's yeah. been my experience with postpartum women, you know, as, as you know, and as we talk about on this show, you know, women are discharged from the hospital at whatever point they're discharged, usually within three days. And they're not seen again for six weeks. Exactly. They're expected to get in and out of cars, taking babies to pediatrician appointments. They're expected mm-hmm. to do all their own self-care. They're expected to, you know, do any number of things. Mm-hmm. And of course they're given a sheet of paper that says, if you have any of these problems, come back and see us. Right. But I, it has been my experience in the past um, that, when my clients have gone back to teaching hospitals, for example, um, the the people who are seeing them don't actually understand no. <laughs> their complaints, you know, right. their, their, their legitimate complaints and kind of give them a shrug and send them back home. I've had to mm-hmm. actually, you know, much like a birth doula might do, accompany clients back to their care providers and say, no, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. this client needs to be seen. There's this issue. It's my theory that this is what's going on, you know, actually show up for them and, and speak on their behalves and insist that they be seen to appropriately Mm -hmm. and not just, shrugged off. And so, you know, it's, that's a rare thing. in in the case of most of my clients, but, but when it's happening, right. You know, clients need somebody who actually has a clue and, and it's extremely rare that if they have a partner in the first place, that partner has any idea of what to do. Right. Not only that, that person is usually going to have to be caring for, the newborn while mom's being seen to. Mm -hmm. So mom still needs an advocate, right? Um, And And hopefully one that hasn't, has an idea of what's going on. And and that's, that's what, that's the, that's the thing that people need to understand. It's like, and, and um, one of the things that I do that I've started to do is uh, training the family. Well, I was curious about that. You know, I, I'm always happy to talk to um, friends and family members who've offered to be of service mm-hmm. uh, because I feel like, gosh, you know, I can, I can teach them a few things and they'll be so much more powerful. Yes. So tell me about that, Monique. Yes. Tell me about how you work with friends well, and family. I have, a, I have classes um, for the family called Village village prep and it's part of a village harmony series um i love this yeah i love the title you chose what a great because it takes a village it absolutely Mm -hmm. takes a village and the village starts before that baby is even here Mm -hmm. and we have to make sure that mom and her partner if there is a partner are um squared away in what in, in being able to care for that baby. And yeah. so um, what I do with my clients, if they would like for, if they have a lot of family, especially who's going to be around, one, because I never want to come in and uh, be the usurper, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes that is, especially in certain cultures, if, you know, with black families, definitely um, that, you know, I'm a stranger, mm. you know, mom might trust me. Dad might even trust me, but you know, <laughs> but grandma Randy doesn't might, know you. <laughs> Randy don't know me. Yeah. You know, auntie don't know me. Yeah. So I'm a stranger doing things that, you know, granny thinks she should be doing. Mm-hmm. And so what I want to do and, is, and might love to do. Right. right might, exactly. Yeah. And so as doers, and I mean, we are told that we do all we can to bring the family in and to help to delegate things to the family. And so what I want the family to know is what I know, 
because when I'm not here, you're here. Yeah. So if you don't, I mean, you know, it's great to, you know, the money that I make, but ultimately my goal is to leave mom and dad equipped and prepared. Yeah. You know, and, and that's that. So if you're able to do, and, and the thing is, is that, the more that I talk to families and tell families, like, this is what you can do, the more the families rely on me. Yeah. They call me. They call yes. me and tell me what's going on. I think she's got this happening. What do you think? Can you come over? Yeah. So that, you know, that happens. And so it, 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 may, it creates a village. And I'm, part of, and I'm part of the village for however long I'm part of the village. And usually it ends up being forever because, you know, Oh yeah, <laughs> you're with these clients and you're seeing them give birth and raise yeah. these, you know, newborns, and so it's like you become part of the family. That's right. So, um, but in in this, I teach the you know families. I ask the parents what their parenting plans are. If they plan to breastfeed, you know, if, if they're planning to vaccinate, you know, mm-hmm. are they having a home birth or a hospital birth? And so mm-hmm. sometimes these issues are hotbed issues for families, right? You know. Yeah. And so what I come in and do is I teach families like, hey, if we want, I know that everybody does not agree, but one one thing is their parenting decisions are not personal affronts to you yeah. <laughs> and to what you've done as a mother or father for them. It's simply their choice, and these are the ways that you can better support them. Beautifully so, put. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, if there's, if, so it's like, yeah, when we talk about breastfeeding, you know, Black people, we have a very long history in this country with, you know, slavery and Jim Crow and things like that. And so, you know, we... We have mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers and aunts who will say to us things like, don't spoil the baby. Mm-hmm. And that basically means like, you don't have to pick the baby up every single time the baby cries. Well, these types of things come from slavery, from Jim Crow, mm-hmm. where you have mothers whose babies might actually be sold out from under them after they have it. Yeah. Or, or if they're, if they're quote unquote lucky enough to keep their babies, they don't get to necessarily mother them. They might be in the big house breastfeeding somebody else's kid. Yes, exactly. Which is just. And uh, having a, having a howling baby could mean death for you or that baby. Yeah. So you want the baby to be quote unquote good. You want the baby to be able to sleep through the night without you. Mm -hmm. You want the baby to be quiet as long as it possibly can. So these things are things that are deeply ingrained in our culture that we have to untie and unlearn and clear out, you know. Um, And so sometimes we have to, sometimes I have to go in and actually teach families Okay, here are the statistics. This is this is these are the studies that show why it's important for mothers to hold their babies when the babies cry. Yeah. This is why it's important for mama to breastfeed the baby every time the baby wants to breastfeed instead of putting the baby on the schedule. This yeah. is why. And so instead of, you know, saying and I give them tools like, hey, like these are things that you can say to voice your concern instead of this. So instead of, you know, when you going to get that baby off the breast, <laughs> <laughs> you can ask. Like, Which my hey, dad said to me. <laughs> right. I breastfed my child since she was three. So yeah, yeah. I heard it all. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yes, I've heard you, it all. You gave yourself <laughs> plenty of so, opportunity to hear it all. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, you know, maybe you can ask in a certain way. And this is like, this is really the worldwide average for breastfeeding. And, yeah. you know, it is actually still nutritious for a toddler to breastfeed. It's just not comfort. It is comfort, but children need to be comforted. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing. Right. So 
you know, and so I go in and I teach them and I tell them some things to look for as far as postpartum mood disorders, like some things that, you know, no, it's, it's not normal for mom to just not be getting sleep. It's, it's, it's not yeah. normal for her to be paranoid. Like we, we, mothers worry, but there's a difference between regular, you know, mother worry and anxiety. Right. There's, yeah. there's, there's a difference between these things. And so it's not, you know, we don't diagnose, but this is, these are things, these are things that you can look for so that, you know, maybe she needs some extra help. Maybe she needs to contact a professional. Maybe you need to alert dad. And even dad, um, because dads suffer from postpartum mood disorders pretty much on par with mothers. Yeah. And so it, it looks totally different, but you know, they suffer too. And so they need support as well. And so making sure that families are, you know, making dad feel valuable and not just like he's just the extra dude in the room, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, which is how a lot of dads feel sometimes, you know, and sometimes mm-hmm. they can tend to assert themselves in, you know, less than optimal ways because they feel like, someone is trying, you know, trying to say that they're not valuable. Right. So, you know, even in, in, in these situations and in, in situations where, you know, maybe they're, there's a single mother, the dad's around, but they're not together. And so these are kind of some, you know, real precarious situations where family is very important to, you know, and, you know, unless of course there's like some abusive things going on there, but, you know, for the most part, you know, people get together and they break up and it just is what it is. And so that we don't create any huge risk and, you know, things that are not necessary. This is the way that we can support him and support him being around and, and taking care of his child and the mother of the child, you know, without having to add any extra ridiculousness to the situation. Right. It's not the time to resolve all your issues with exactly. your daughter's partner, you it know, exact, and <laughs> it's not the time to really something about childbirth that just brings all the drama. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's excellent for doing that, but you know, yeah. yes. And teaching people like, Hey, and we can chill for six weeks. We can, like we yeah. can, we can we can chill on we don't have to have any super deep conversations. We don't have to make any huge big life changing decisions. We've already made the biggest life decision there is to make. You know, yeah. the baby care. So Right. You know, and so there, <laughs> this is this is these are things that I that I um that I go through with some of my clients and their family. And that's you know, fantastic. Just, just really trying to give them some some tools. And, um, you know, because there's, I mean, hey, I've gone through it. You know, I'm an unmarried mama. I've had some crazy issues with my child's father and postpartum depression because of that. You know, I'm right there with you twice. Yeah, right. (laughs) In my case, yeah. And, you know, it got really crazy when she was older, but it was crazy then, like after she was born. So. You know, I I understand, you know, and not, you know, there's no shame or blame on to, to anyone, but I see in hindsight how my family could have handled things a lot better. You know, I could have handled things a lot better if there was someone there to kind of help us all navigate. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, so. sometimes just just an objective Right. Caring support person who can say, what if we set aside this issue for the Mm -hmm. next few weeks while we attend to these issues over here, you know, that are right, that are present and pressing. And sometimes people will find that some of those things just really aren't important. Right. Give them enough time. They just dissipate. (laughs) Right. They just don't even matter. Like it's, it really didn't matter that, you know, this happened or that happened. And yeah. 
you know, and with mothers too, you know, and my doula actually told me this and, you know, I did some research on it and it, it helped me a lot because I know with families, especially with families that, you know, of single mothers and say they, you know, she broke up with the dad, you know, a while ago, usually when she has the babies, you'll see her start to want to be back with him. Mm-hmm. It is a biological response. Yeah. It's, it has nothing to do with, she really wants to be with him, has nothing to do with any of that. It has everything to do with a biological evolutionary response for her to keep her family together. Right. And so, yeah. and that will, that will happen. That she will vacillate between, I love him, I hate him, I want him, I don't want him for at least two years after she has that baby. And, yeah. and well, and you know, you think about it like, um, you know, for two to three years after giving birth, the, the child itself is so biologically dependent upon the mother's yes. body, yes. right, to provide it with immunity and, and, and nourishment and protection. You know, when a mother has to be subsumed under all that, she kind of needs an umbrella over herself. Yes. And so, naturally, you know, I She's think going we to look toward the person who gave her that baby. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I think the the assumptions beneath that are perfectly valid. Yes. You know, you're going to want yes. your kid to survive, so you're going to want me to survive. Yeah. Uh, and yes. so maybe you're willing to do the things that it takes to have that happen, you know. Yes. And so, so even though in our culture it's very confusing and confused, it does make perfect sense. Yes. Um, and so, so that's what I think, you know, people need to understand that it's like we can't. And so we can't as, you know, the, the supporting family and the extended family then put more stress and more strain on her saying, you don't need him. Why are you trying to do? Why do you want to, you know, all of that stuff has to be by the wayside. And instead having some understanding and some support. And because, and which is the reason why a lot of women, like after, you know, you, like you said, like you, you believe that, oh, the baby's going to change him, but that's <laughs> simply a biological, it's simply a biological response because uh, one, you are, you are con the, the DNA of the person who made the baby with you is still inside you. Right. So you are connected to that person <laughs> by your child. Hear that, people? <laughs> so biologically, evolutionary, the, the evolution of human beings has made it so that you wish to be close to that person. And not being close to that person, it, it, it needs and deserves someone to hold space. So if that yeah. person is not there, you need to understand that that woman needs even more support. She needs even more support because there is there is a literally almost like a tearing away of a part of her that's yeah. happening. And so there is no person. Hear me, folks. <laughs> <laughs> there is no person who can do this thing alone. It doesn't mean you have to be married. It doesn't mean you have to be coupled. It doesn't mean any of that. But you definitely need support. And you need support who is not, I, I, I like to tell my family, be a shoulder, not a boulder. Yeah. We don't need, we don't need people crushing. <laughs> you don't need to crush anyone. You don't have to go there with the I told you so. You don't have to give lectures on why he's not great and why she's better off without him and all this stuff. She knows these things already. That, but that's not what she, what she needs is rest, nutrition, a shoulder to cry on. She needs the space to be able to, to, to cry and sob and scream and mourn. <laughs> yeah. She needs that. Allow it and be there. Yeah. Be there. Because that is ultimately what is best for that child. 
and be there authentically. I mean, I think it goes a long yeah. way if you can say to your daughter who's bringing forth her daughter or son, um, you know, here's what I am available for to you. You know, yeah. I, I want to offer you reassurance that I love you. I love your baby. And that, you know, um, I can bring you a pot of stew once a week and I can come, yeah. come for a visit of X amount of mm -hmm. minutes or hours this time each week. And I'm committed to doing that for you. Now that's some real practical reassurance. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's like, okay, and if I have to make it from Monday through Thursday, I know somebody's here on Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Or if, you know, if I'm not going to be able to get to the market, at least I know I've got three days worth of food yeah. in the fridge. Uh, you know, whatever it is, that kind of actual, practical, and authentic. Like, don't mm -hmm. say what you're not going to do. I mean, right. don't say you're going to do something that you can't do. That's not going to be helpful. Yeah. And, and, and it's going to be like triple not helpful yes. for a new mom. You don't have to do everything. No. But you have to, and parents, I would urge parents to be, to really sit down. And this is another thing that I, that I teach my parents. To really sit down and know who is part of your village. Everyone is not going to be part of your village. No. Who is a part of your village? Who are those people that you know that you can express your needs to? And if they are able, they will, they will help and they will support and make your needs known. People can't read your mind. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't ask, people think mm -hmm. you got it. Yeah. If you don't ask, they think, do not try to put on a brave face for those who are coming to see your baby so that they can look at your baby, tickle your baby, and then leave you with an overstimulated baby <laughs> through the rest of the night. Damn it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is the worst thing at midnight yeah. when you have not slept since midnight the night before. So. Yeah. I, my advice to all parents is if you, the only people who should be around are those people who are helping, period. Yeah. For that first at least month, at least for the first month, six weeks is ideal. But at least for the first month, the only people who should be around are people who are actually supporting you, meaning people who are doing some laundry, washing some dishes, cooking some food, washing mm -hmm. your other children. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, those people, not people who are just coming to hang and watch Real Housewives and, and yeah. look at the baby for and not notice that minutes. you could be sleeping when your baby's actually yeah. asleep instead yeah. of gapping about what they did at work today. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. People yeah. Who, yes. And people, if all they can do is come over for you to be able to shower and take a nap, that's yeah. cool too. Yeah, an hour, hour and a half, you could yeah. really benefit from that. I think that's often what people who would like to help don't understand is, you know, right. the short visits are often the really actually efficacious visits, yeah. not not the three hours, let's sit and talk about your birth, you know, it right. might be traumatic and triggering for moms to talk about their exactly. birth, and they exactly. should be allowed to feel a sense of privacy around that. But yeah. um you know, they don't owe it to you to tell you their story. No. Um, no. Yeah. So, Monique, um, I, I hate to say this. Uh, we've been talking for an hour and a quarter. I and know. I, I, I can talk for three more. I can tell. Like, I could just listen to you for hours. But we do have to wrap it up today. But perhaps yeah. we'll have you on on another occasion. I feel like this yeah. is just great stuff. For our listeners um, who've had the benefit of, of hearing uh, Monique talk today, I also just want to remind you that if you're not lucky enough to live in the the um, the L.A. area where you can have access to Monique and her special services, um one of the things that she pointed to um, in both in terms of supporting um, 
you know, uh, new mothers, but in particular, this health crisis we have in America for for black mothers. Um, if you get a chance, get the book, The Big Letdown by Kimberly Allers Seals and read mm-hmm. that, whatever community you're in, uh, because it's all about breastfeeding and how it's been undermined in our country and some really great things to talk about in terms of what to do next. And like Monique, Kimberly is somebody who's actually done local interventions in inner cities to help change the culture, uh, the family and neighborhood culture around supporting new mothers. So, um, uh, we can all learn more about that, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. And Kimberly is awesome. She, she is has, awesome. Yeah. Get her book. Yeah. So, Monique, I am just thrilled that we finally got you on the program and that I got to interview you. Uh, I'm sorry Sarah isn't here. She's lovely. Um, and... Um, I hope we can do it again. Yeah, I had such a good time talking to you, Ashley. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, you're so welcome. And um, why don't you um, tell our listeners how to um, contact you or just, you know, follow you if there are ways, uh, social media, et cetera, that you'd like your our audience to know about? All right. Well, you can all always go to my website at Monique the doula.wordpress.com. Nice. Um, I am also on Facebook. You can find me at uh, facebook.com slash mothering mamas. That's M A M A S. And I'm on Instagram and YouTube at Monique the doula. So you can get at me in any of those ways. Nice. Um, send me a message. Um, through any of those avenues, and I will get back to you. Clearly, I get I respond within a few hours, depending on if my phone is dead or not. <laughs> Don't do this in the middle of the night. She needs her sleep. She's a doula. <laughs> yes, I am a doula, so yes, I have clients we're, overnight. <laughs> we're talking about Pacific time, people. Yes, Pacific time is daytime, please. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is wonderful. And we will um, put links on our, um, our page for for Monique as well. And um, we look forward to having you uh, all listen to her show and future shows. And don't uh, be shy about going back into our archives to to listen to past shows. And we hope you have a great fourth trimester, one way or the other. (laughs) Thanks again, Monique. Thank you. You can subscribe to this podcast in order to hear more from us. Thank you for listening, everyone. And I hope you'll join us next time on the fourth trimester. The theme music on this podcast was created by Sean Trott. Hear more at soundcloud.com slash Sean Trott. Special thanks to my true loves, my husband, Ben, daughter, Penelope, and baby girl, Evelyn. Don't forget to share the fourth trimester podcast with any new and expecting parents. I'm Sarah Trott. Goodbye for now. Bicycle man, I know you're doing all that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I'll sing a song for you. You got your wheels, you got your gears, you ride around town with. Out any fear You got your pedals You got your brakes You always wear your helmet For safety's sake
Hello again, bicycle man. I know you're doing all that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I sing a song for you. Hello again, bicycle man. I know you're doing the best that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I sing a song for you.